And then you end up with all the children going long distances on the bus, which is no good for them, to the regional school. And then you have country boys and girls who are being mixed with city boys and girls. So then they get into the drug scene. So we've seen with consolidation that the test scores go down, the drug problem gets worse, the cost of education increases, although they tell you that consolidation is to make it cheaper. A lot of people just don't understand the word consolidation. Consolidation is consolidating all the services together under the guise of this is going to be cheaper for you. But in the process, what happens is you lose all your elected officials because all of these entities are being merged. So at the local level, you don't have any representation anymore. And ultimately, you spend far more. That's the whole restructuring of our constitutional form of government, is being thrown to the wolves in favor of this regionalism and consolidation system in every area, education, uh, you know, government bureaucracy to make things cheaper, uh, you name it, uh, planning, the word is central planning, that's the Soviet system, central planning, regionalism, no matter how beautiful everything looks outside, no matter how good those restaurants are in your town, or the good funny movies, or the whatever, no matter whatever beautiful things you see in your life, and your family, etc., etc., folks, it's curtains. October 24, 1975, the World Affairs Council uh, of Philadelphia issued a Declaration of Interdependence, written by well-known historian and liberal think tank Aspen Institute board member Henry Steele Commager. This alarming document, which called to mind President Kennedy's July 4, 1962 speech calling for a Declaration of Interdependence, Kennedy, huh? was written as a contribution to our nation's celebration of its 200th birthday and signed by 125 members of the U.S. Senate and House. When in the course of history the threat of extinction confronts mankind, it is necessary for the people of the United States to declare their interdependence with the people of all nations and to embrace those principles and build those institutions which will enable mankind to survive and civilization to flourish. Two centuries ago, our forefathers brought forth a new nation. Now we must join with others to bring forth a new world order. We affirm that the economy of all nations is a seamless web and that no one man can any longer effectively maintain its processes of production and monetary systems without recognizing the necessity for collaborative regulation by international authorities. This little blue book is called Conclusions and Recommendations, and it has a weird title, and you'd think it only deals with social studies, but it doesn't. It's the Report of the Commission on the Social Studies. It was funded by the Carnegie Corporation, and the book virtually recommends that the curriculum all be geared towards the Soviet system, internationalism, planned economy, etc. It's been referred to by a leading British uh, professor of British socialism as a, a plan for a socialist America. This book is at my son's website, americandeception.com, thank heavens, because this is the only copy that exists in the whole world, right here. All right, so that's dated 1934. And, and what they're doing there is they're, they're really talking about putting in a planned economy. So that's what we're putting in right now with the, the program that's just going into our little school in Dresden, Maine. We've put in the De Lorenzo Reinventing Schools uh, plan, which I said earlier, uh, your, your, kids, your children will be graduating at 14 or 21. No grades, no ABCD no kindergarten through 12th grade, because it's going to all be workforce training and the curriculum will be based on the Malcolm Baldrige Total Quality Management Award. It has only in the past been given to Cadillac and Hilton Hotels and things like that. The Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award gets results. We're not there yet. We're continuously improving and it's something that is so deep in our organization that the concepts and principles of Baldrige will be applied forever here. So this same Carnegie Corporation in 1933 
instituted the eight-year study, which went on until 1941. That's the Skinner method, performance-based, results-based. That's all what you, what you can do, not what you know in your head. They don't want children to think or know anything, no history. No. It's what you can do for the good of the global economy. And uh, the Education Commission of the States, a very important unconstitutional regional entity, which controls education in every state as well, they had a little newsletter that I used to get. And one day I was reading it, and my eyes went down to the bottom of the page, and I said something. It said, it said outcomes-based education is, and of course I'd always been fighting outcomes-based education, and it said it was experimented with for eight years in the 1930s and 40s by the Carnegie Corporation. It was called the eight-year study. So nothing's new, folks. If we think the outcomes-based education, that we, which, which is the biggest dumbing down education system that ever happened with children graduating at 14, right? Uh, if we think that it's new, no. It came from the eight-year study, which again was Carnegie. Okay. Now Carnegie, we might as well mention this at the same tone. 1965, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, Carnegie was all involved in paying for the national assessment which is all 60% politically correct. That's the test that all schools around the country have had to give for the past, ever since 1965. Now it is 60% politically correct. Your kids' ideas on uh, global warming, sustainable development, a world government, the fact that constitution's outmoded, all that. So they paid for the national assessment. They were the ones instrumental in putting up the money for the Education Commission of the States in Denver. In your Senate Education Committee, in your state, there's always going to be one person who is on the membership of the uh, Education Commission of the state. So there'll be about 50 state people. So they get their orders from the Education Commission of the states. That's Carnegie, paid for that. In 1985, Carnegie signed an agreement with the, with the Soviet Academy of Science. At the same time, Reagan signed the agreements with Gorbachev to merge the two education systems. Carnegie. Uh, signed with the Academy of Science to develop computer courseware for elementary schools dealing with critical thinking. That was an agreement signed. That's for our children, right? In first grade, critical thinking on the computer. Reagan, Clinton, the two Bushes and all implement the school to work agenda. That was the beginning of the planned economy under Reagan. So then uh, Mark Tucker comes in, Carnegie. All the controversy going on in the 90s, Americans were up in arms about the destruction of their school systems. They would go in deliberately and destroy, because in order to restructure, you have to destroy. Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, David Hornbeck, who's big on compulsory uh, uh, community service, compulsory. He called for that when he was the superintendent of schools in uh, in Maryland. He was the commissioner. Way back, he called for a mandatory service. That's another thing, folks. You better watch out. You're going to be, we're going to be slaves. Mandatory service. So anyway, the same Hornbeck, who's connected to Carnegie all along, goes into Kentucky, destroys that system, goes up to Rochester, New York. He goes out to the state of Washington, U Iowa, destroy the schools, restructure them for school to work. That's all Carnegie. And the latest information coming in uh, for Maine with a complete uh, recommendation, that is. Who knows? Maybe our governor, well, we can get to him fast enough, you know, to help him understand what, that we can't have charter schools. Charter schools are the vehicle to implement the planned economy. We can't have them. They're unelected school boards anyway. We don't even have a school board with a charter school. They get federal money. Why no school board? They get federal money, so we have to give the federal test. No charter schools, forget it. So all of this is coming together, coalescing at the same time. The 3,000 page hearings of the Congressional Investigation of the Reese Committee, uh, investigation of the subversive activities of the tax exempt foundations. I bought the only available copy in the country, 3,000 pages from a really good friend of mine, a wonderful American. He had been offered any, any amount of money for that 20 years ago by one of the minions of the found, tax exempt foundations. They did not want that copy 
to be floating around. The research director for those hearings, his name was Norman Dodd. I knew him. And uh, the conversation that I'm going to discuss right now that he had uh, with the president of the Ford Foundation, Rowan Gaither, was off the record in New York City at Ford Foundation headquarters. And Norman Dodd told me over dinner in Washington, D.C., in a restaurant in Georgetown, Rowan Gaither said to him, Mr. Dodd, uh, you know, basically, we've, we at the foundations, we don't determine the agenda. The agenda has come from directions from the White House. That was Eisenhower at the time, right at the peak of the Cold War. And that agenda, our instructions are to use our tax-exempt status, your money, folks, change America so it can be comfortably merged with the Soviet Union. Now, a lot of you may say, well, that never happened. Well, it's happening right now, folks. It's happening right now as we speak. Foundation-funded non-bloody revolution. Committee Chairman Carol Reese warned fellow congressmen of a diabolical conspiracy that a certain few foundations were financing the socialist and communist overthrow of the United States. Uh, after World War I, they tried to get the League of Nations in. And there was tremendous opposition to that. And then you had opposition between then and between World War II. You had Lindbergh and all the, a lot of Americans going before the Congress to keep us from going into the UN. You had all sorts of opposition. But they got their way. The Reese Committee learned that the Rockefeller Foundation and Carnegie Endowment for International Peace were, with tax-exempt dollars, funding leftist propaganda operations aimed at changing America through the brain, not the battlefield. Patriotism, national sovereignty, individual responsibility, and Christian beliefs were belittled, while the concepts of a one-world government, socialism, collectivism, and humanism were deemed essential for peace in the modern age. A clandestine and successful non-bloody revolution had been masterminded by some of America's most powerful and devious men, men who did not want to be exposed by a congressional investigating committee. The man chosen by Reese to be the committee's research director was Norman Dodd, Yale graduate, intellectual, and New York investment banker. During this writer's frequent visits to Dodd's retired home in Keene, Virginia, he repeatedly spoke, Dodd, of his conviction that justice demanded that those foundations should be compelled to spend a like amount of dollars to undo the damage they have done to America." End quote. Dodd sent committee questionnaires to numerous foundations and as a result of one such request, Joseph E. Johnson, president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, invited Dodd to send a committee staffer to Carnegie's headquarters in New York City to examine the minutes of the meetings of the endowment's trustees. Now this is Carnegie we're talking about, the one I always go after. These minutes had long since been stored away in a warehouse and obviously Johnson, who was a close friend of former Carnegie president and Soviet spy Alger Hiss, had no idea what was in them. Don't forget Alger Hiss headed up the UN in San Francisco. He was the head of the whole thing, world government. The, the minutes reveal that in 1910, the Carnegie trustees asked themselves this question, colon, quote, is there any way known to man more effective than war to so alter the life of an entire people, end quote. This is in the minutes. For, for a year, the trustees sought an effective, peaceful method to alter the life of an entire people. But ultimately, they concluded that war was the most effective way to change people. Oh, God. World War I. Horrible war. Oh, God. I mean, it made every other war look like nothing. Consequently, the trustees of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace next asked themselves, quote, how do we re-involve the United States in a war? And they answered, quote, we must control the diplomatic machinery of the United States by first gaining control of the State Department. Now, don't forget, this is 1910. Norm Dodd said that the trustees' minutes reinforced what the Reese Committee had uncovered elsewhere about the Carnegie Endowment.